Okay, everyone. Um, I think we will begin. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a terrific turnout. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Frank Matero. I'm uh, chair of the Historic Preservation Program here at Penn, and it's my uh, privilege and honor to welcome you tonight. Um, the identification of places of historic and cultural significance is an old practice. Uh, but our subject tonight belongs to a relatively new category of heritage places reflecting the darker side of human actions. Chernobyl will long be remembered as the world's worst nuclear accident, but it's also a place of resilience, transformation, and hope, um, as the exhibit uh, clearly indicates. We should remember that the word monument from the Latin monere means to warn or to admonish despite its common associations with commemoration, regardless of whose viewpoint um, is being celebrated. Every day more sites join the ranks of those that represent a legacy of social intolerance, injustice, and environmental abuse and disaster. These two are old stories, but our willingness to confront and embrace them as witness is a relatively new turn. So as preservation professionals, we must prepare ourselves to listen to those with first-hand knowledge and experience in order to take theory into practice and assist in helping carry the legacy forward. Such is the act of interpretation, a practice we all engage in regardless of our specializations, our disciplinary specializations. To interpret literally is to make sense, to use the senses to help activate the narratives associated with such places to make the intangible tangible. Making sense, new ways of thinking about interpretation and experience at historic places is a new initiative of Penn's preservation program. And it will extend over the next three years through lectures, exhibits, panel discussions, projects, and hopefully symposia. So it's my great pleasure tonight to have Myron Statue with us to inaugurate this initiative um, with both a lecture, it's a, it's a double header tonight, a lecture and an exhibit. The lecture tonight, as you can see, uh, is Cultural Rescue in the Chernobyl Zone, Documenting Traditional Culture in a Post-Apocalyptic Environment. And on a lighter note, the exhibition is entitled Chernobyl Plus 20, This is Our Land, We Still Live Here. So with that, let me introduce our speaker. Um, Myron Statue is an educator, historian, archaeologist, and architectural historian. During the past four decades, he's worked as a museum professional, university professor, and educational administrator in the U.S. and in Ukraine. He's currently engaged as a consultant in architectural history to museums, to historical agencies, and state and local preservation um, uh, organizations, focusing on the preparation of historic structure reports. This past summer, he helped to organize and teach a two-week workshop in Ukraine focused on conducting a conservation assessment of a Ukrainian wooden church, circa 1693. Um, Myron lived in Ukraine from 2004 to 2012, first as a recipient of a Fulbright Award and then as the director of the Fulbright Program in Ukraine and the Ukraine Office of the Institute of International Education. Uh, the focus of his Fulbright uh, Scholar project was a study of the process of cultural rescue undertaken by Ukrainian scholars within the heavily irradiated territories of Ukraine resulting from the April 26, 1986 Chernobyl nuclear power plant reactor explosion. Statue participated in several extended expeditions to the region with Ukrainian folklorists, ethnographers, architectural historians, and material cultural specialists, as well as many private trips to document the impacts of the disaster on the people and the landscape. A product of his research was the large photographic exhibit, Chernobyl Plus 20, This Is Our Land, We Still Live Here, which was shown simultaneously in Kiev, Ukraine, and New York in 2006, and now we have it here. So with that, uh, Myron, there are so many reasons to have you here, um, and I hope this is not the last, um, but I'm really pleased uh, to have you kick off this initiative, the talk and the exhibit on this very complex and challenging issue. Thank you. The floor is yours. 
Good evening. I'd like to start by thanking the Weizmann School of Design and Dr. Frank Matero, Chair of the Historic Preservation Program and Director of the Center uh, for Architectural Conservation for hosting the ex exhibition and inviting me to speak this evening. I also thank John Hinchman of the Center for Architectural Conservation and his wife Monica for their very generous hospitality these past few days. Uh, and John uh, and Evan Oskierko Yeznatsky for their assistance in all aspects of mounting this exhibit. This evening I'll discuss my experiences in Ukraine uh, with cultural heritage issue, and more specifically, as Frank had mentioned, with my research and involvement from 2004 to 2006, documenting a project of cultural rescue following the Chernobyl nuclear power station disaster. You may ask, why is it Chernobyl instead of Chernobyl? Well, Chernobyl uh, is a transliteration from the Russian. Uh, Chernobyl is a transliteration from the Ukrainian. Uh, so I prefer to use Chernobyl, even though they always write Chernobyl, and that's the way it's known, but let's do it right. My formal engagement with Ukraine began in 1989, but my informal engagement began at birth as the second-born son of Ukrainian parents who came to the U.S. in 1947 from displaced persons camps in Germany. At university and graduate school, I studied anthropology, historical archaeology, American history, and architectural history. Uh, after which I worked at Old Sturbridge Village as a research historian for nearly a decade. While there I applied to and was awarded a grant by the American Association of Museums through their International Partnerships Among Museums program to spend six weeks at the Museum of Folk Architecture and Rural Life in Lviv, Ukraine. This is an open air museum on the model of Skansen in Sweden, the world's oldest open air museum. In fact, the common name for such museums in Ukrainian is Skansen. My goal was to learn how this open-air museum of folk architecture conducted fieldwork and restoration, and how the buildings they collected and preserved were presented and interpreted. During this and regular subsequent visits to Ukraine over the next decade, I became acquainted with a number of Ukrainian scholars who had been taking part in expeditions to the Ukrainian territories that were heavily irradiated by the radioactive fallout from the Chernobyl disaster. I listened with great interest to stories of their work in the zone and was in awe of what to me were heroic and courageous acts of scholarly engagement under dangerous circumstances. I longed to join them in, these noble, in this noble work, uh, but it was not until 2004 that I was able to realize that wish when I obtained a Fulbright Scholar Award. My goal during the Fulbright was to study and document the efforts of Ukrainian ethnographers, architectural historians, linguists, folklorists, uh, material culture scholars, and archaeologists in this work that I've termed cultural rescue of the very archaic traditional culture of the peoples who occupy the territory uh, known as Polisia uh, in Ukraine. Polisia was a region most heavily irradiated by the fallout. The shading here shows uh, uh, indicates where the, the, the highest uh, uh, levels of radiation were recorded. Uh, most heavily irradiated by the fallout from the power station accident, a meltdown of the reactor core of one of four working reactors at the site, which occurred on April 26, 1986. This region was also the least studied by ethnographers, as it was largely a wooded, swampy region which faced few development pressures with forest industries and agriculture and the nuclear power station, the main activities. There was also, uh, little known to most people, a secret radar installation created nearby uh, to alert the USSR of incoming US and NATO missiles powered by the nearby reactors. And in fact, uh, a little known fact is that virtually all of the power generated by this, these power stations here uh, was exported for uh, income to the USSR and not to supply the local country, the radar station and export. If I may ask, how many of you watched the recent HBO program on a Chernobyl disaster? All right, well, fair, not, not a whole lot, a fair number. So the story is known to some of you, and most of you know uh, uh, 
the gist of the story, but let me give you a brief history. In the early morning hours of April 26, 1986, a poorly conceived and executed experiment in reactor number four of the Chernobyl nuclear power station went horribly wrong. With all of the safety mechanisms and backup systems manually disabled for the experiment during a shutdown, the reactor core began to dangerously overheat, suffered two explosions, and began what every nuclear engineer has nightmares about, a meltdown of the core. The resultant explosions and fires sent up to 40 tons of radioactive material into the atmosphere, the equivalent of more than several hundred times the radiation from the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, poisoning tens of thousands of square kilometers of heavily populated forest, farmland, and urban places in Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia with radioactive fallout and changing the course of history. First detected by scientists in Sweden and initially denied by Soviet authorities, the radioactive fallout spread across the earth over the ensuing days, causing the slaughter, uh, wait a second here. causing the slaughter of sheep herds as far away as Scotland and causing many women to abort their pregnancies in Greece uh, for fear from, uh, of the impacts of the radiation. Many scholars believe that the stresses brought on by the Chernobyl disaster to the government and economy of the Soviet Union and its loss of credibility on both international and domestic levels as a result of its handling of the crisis were the proverbial, quote, straw that broke the camel's back and contributed significantly to the ultimate collapse of the Soviet Union five years later. In Ukraine alone, radioactive fallout from the damaged reactor contaminated 8.9% of Ukraine's territory over an area of more than 40,000 square kilometers, nearly 20,000 square miles of Ukraine's fertile earth. Just as a comparison, the combined areas of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island is only 13,724 square miles. More than three and a half million residents, among them nearly one million children, in nearly 2,700 villages, towns, and cities, a full 5% of Ukraine's population in 1986, were exposed to radioactive fallout. And this excludes the three million residents of Kyiv, located just the capital city, uh, located just 80 kilometers from the reactor. Uh, this was excluded from the radiation maps and counts for reasons of convenience, economics, and of course social order, not to create horrible panic and rushes away from the city. In one of the great crimes of humanity, the Soviet authorities allowed the May Day parade to go off as planned in Kyiv five days after the explosion, despite the fact that radiation readings in the city from the fallout had reached levels as much as 3,000 times the normal levels. To date, more than two million people outside of the city of Kyiv still live on contaminated lands in Ukraine. I remember in 1989 flying over on an airplane uh, for the first time to Ukraine, and I was sitting next to a young woman who described to me how uh, that spring, the chestnut trees in Kyiv, which Kyiv is very well known for its chestnut trees, bloomed twice. Uh, and the second time, the leaves were gigantic, very large. The first ones fell off, bloomed, fell off, and then the second growth was extraordinarily large. So if it did that to the trees. <laughs> In the first several weeks after the accident, more than 100,000 people were relocated from the city of Pripyat, situated just a few kilometers from the reactor, and which ha housed the thousands of workers who serviced these reactors and their families, and from more than 70 surrounding villages situated within a 30-kilometer radius zone around the reactor. This zone of exclusion was to delineate the area where radiation was believed to be highest due to the heaviest fallout, especially of the heavy element of plutonium. With a half-life of nearly 25,000 years, the plutonium ensured that it would be an inconceivably long time before this area could ever again be repopulated and used in any normal way. <laughs> 
standard calculations for the decay of radionuclides to safe levels at which low-risk reoccupation could occur are 10 half cycles. CCM-137 and strontium-90, uh, the two most widely distributed radioactive contaminants and particularly dangerous ones because of the way they insinuate themselves into tissues and bones of plants and animals, have a half-life of approximately 30 years. In addition, huge quantities of radioactive waste, contaminated equipment used in the cleanup, and debris were stored or deposited in more than 800 burial sites located within the exclusion zone. A serious problem that continues to exist is that the locations of many of these dumps was not recorded or mapped. But I was told by field researchers in the zone that they're not that difficult to identify given the mutations that have developed in the vegetation that's grown over these dumps. You can see from the mapping of radiation that some areas uh, in the exclusion zone, well, let me go back one, some areas in the exclusion zone uh, experience very little radioactive fallout, while areas well outside the zone were just as heavily irradiated as the worst lands within the zone. Over the next several years, at least another 100,000 people were evacuated and relocated throughout the country, and at least 100,000 left the region voluntarily. Some contemporary estimates put the number of people who have been dislocated through obligatory or voluntary relocation at more than one million. Four zones were created uh, across the irradiated territories extending westward. The zone of exclusion, where uh, evacuation was obligatory, a zone where uh, it was voluntary and the state would support and pay for you, your family, if you wanted to leave. A third zone where uh, it was slightly lower, and if you wanted to leave, you're on your own. And then a fourth zone that uh, was identified as uh, contaminated uh, and would be monitored, but basically they weren't going to do anything for you at all. For a remarkable discussion uh, of the social, cultural, political, moral, and epidemi epidemiological impacts of the Chernobyl disaster on Ukraine and its victims, I highly recommend to you the book Life Exposed, Biological Citizens After Chern Chernobyl, written by Dr. Adriana Petrina, who is a faculty member of this university's anthropology department. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable book. In, uh, the stories it tells uh, and the uh, regarding the consequences uh, of this disaster. Ukrainian sociologist Yuri Sayenko has identified three terrible catastrophes that the people and nation of Chernobyl of Ukraine have suffered, and by extension, the other nations in the former USSR impacted by the Chernobyl disaster. The first was the disaster itself. Its consequences seriously harmed the environment and people of Ukraine and covered the earth with radioactive rain. The second was the breakdown of the USSR and the destruction of the habitual social and political reality of the world. The situation of a, quote, stable, protected prison was changed for an unclear and frightening freedom, unquote. The third was a deep post-totalitarian political and economic crisis during the 1990s, resulting in a sharp impoverishment of the Ukrainian state and population, and inability to deal effectively with the truly monumental scale of the issues addressing the nation in the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster. These three catastrophes have been superimposed each on the other and have multiplied the impacts of each. Within this context, in the early 1990s, only a few years after the country became a sovereign independent state in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukrainian scholars supported by their government undertook a sustained effort to record, document, and preserve the traditional culture of the contaminated territories of Ukraine. At a conference held in 1992 to plan the cultural rescue efforts, the Minister for Mitigating the Impacts of Chernobyl on the Ukrainian population stated, and I quote, for nearly one half year now, we are building and renewing an independent sovereign Ukraine. This renewal of her independence begins with a spiritual, spiritual reawakening of its people, its history, its culture. 
the rich but plundered Polisian countryside darkened by the shadow of Chernobyl. This is a unique region where archaic traditions have survived. The loss of the unique wooden architecture of Polisia, its traditions, folklore, crafts, this all demands our closest attention and preservation because their loss will be a loss not just for Ukraine, but for all humanity." End of quote. Similar efforts were mounted by scholars in Belarus and Russia, uh, but these were relatively short-lived and quite limited in scope and scale. Only the Ukrainian government continued to sustain the efforts of its ethnographers, folklorists, historians, uh, and other scholars uh, in this endeavor. Today, state support is merely symbolic and certainly not enough to properly continue processing the warehouses full of artifacts and other materials that have been collected, let alone to study and provide some interpretive framework to all of this material. Why were these efforts undertaken and sustained longer in Ukraine than in Belarus and Russia? When I began this research, uh, I hypothesized that these actions were the result of complex nationalistic motivations by Ukrainian leaders, that this was part of a larger geopolitical, geocultural contest among former Soviet republics, and specifically between Ukraine and its longtime political and cultural dominatrix, Russia. If Ukrainian scholars could succeed in recovering, recovering the traditional culture of the Polisia region as a distinctly Ukrainian cultural heritage, then they could draw direct lines of connection from the newly independent Ukrainian nation back to the earliest origins of all Slavic culture. Even further back than to the medieval history of the Kievan Rus Empire, which dominated Eastern Europe from the Baltic to the Black Sea from the 9th to the early 13th century, long before the founding of Moscow and what later became the Russian Empire. Russian imperial and later Soviet historians and ideologues usurp the history of the era of Kievan Rus as a forerunner and, quote, mother of the later Russian Empire, using it uh, to argue that there is no real difference between Ukrainians and Russians. Even forcing upon the Ukrainian lands and people the demeaning names of Little Russia and Little Russians. You can see on this map uh, the use of that phrase. Over the past several decades, Western as well as Ukrainian historians and archaeologists have generally, generally agreed that the very cradle of all Slavic culture more than 1,500 years ago was located in the border, borderlands between the modern states of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, essentially the territory of Polisia, which retains the most distinct and archaic traditional culture of all Ukraine. This culture still retains elements of pre-Christian beliefs and practices and is believed to form a direct link back to early Slavic culture. After years of research, interviews with participants in the expeditions and key people in the planning of the cultural rescue efforts, I've come to the conclusion that the motivation for these efforts at cultural rescue, efforts that can only be called, called heroic at the personal level, was not a calculated gambit in cultural geopolitics, but an effort driven by love of nation and culture, <coughs> as well as scholarly, economic and scholarly opportun opportunism, uh, by the hundreds of scholars who volunteered to work in the contaminated zones. The result is an erratically sustained effort that covers more than 15 years and includes dozens of expeditions into the irradiated territories, the 30 kilometer exclusion zone and to the newly created homes and villages of relocated former residents, all with the goal of recording, documenting, and preserving this spiritual and material folk culture of the Polisia region. To date, more than 300 villages uh, were visited by the expeditions and subjected to some level of field work, interviews, photographs, measured drawings, video filming, and recording of language, folklore, remembered rituals, music, and song. In addition, more than 10,000 objects of traditional material culture have been collected and placed in storage, waiting to be cleaned of radiation, hopefully, and forming a significant collection that some dream will one day be the basis of a museum dedicated to the traditional culture of Polisia, a yet unrealized dream.
While this body represents a truly remarkable accomplishment in the face of tremendous adversity, it unfortunately falls far short of a truly systematic and comprehensive survey and analysis of the culture of Policia. The image we receive of the traditional culture of Policia from these expeditions is largely impressionistic and anecdotal, based on many small and highly idiosyncratic encounters between researchers and subjects, uh, unfortunately not carried out under the umbrella of a, of a unified research model. Among the scholarly community, it is now generally felt that most of the important field work has been completed and little interest remains in continuing the difficult work of cataloging, analyzing, synthesizing, and publishing the results of the past three decades of work. While most scholars now loudly lament the loss of this unique traditional culture of policia, they are content to know that they did their part in collecting and preserving elements of the cu this culture in reports and files, now it's ensconced on the shelves of archives for future generations of scholars to study, if they will be able to get access to them. <laughs> Yet few, if any, acknowledge that there is still more than two million people living within the in irradiated territories of Policia, and that the culture need not die and disappear. Many families have been fractured, with younger families with children fleeing the irradiated territories, leaving behind an aged and largely impoverished population in the more heavily irradiated regions, which were not subjected to mandatory evacuation. One very serious impact of the disaster and the government's largely unavoidable strategy of relocation and the voluntary relocation of younger families was a total disruption of the process of cultural regeneration and transmission from generation to generation, from neighbor to neighbor, from community to community that had existed prior to the Chernobyl disaster in many of the region's towns and villages. The process of relocation did not help the situation either. Most residents evacuated in the first weeks from the exclusion zone we're told that they would be gone only a few days and thus packed only overnight bags. Most never were allowed to return to their homes and belongings, and many were settled across Ukraine and even to other countries in the Soviet Union to, uh, to widely differing communities. Those evacuated over the months and years following the initial evacuations were relocated into environments totally foreign, forest people to the open steppes, for example and into dwellings that were radically different from the, the one or two room log buildings in which they lived their entire lives. Many of these people also suffered depression in their new and sometimes strange environments among people who frequently resent, resented their presence and the government benefits they received for having been exposed to the radiation. Some feared that the radiation would be passed on to them somehow, person to person and often made fun of the traditions of the relocated politians. In some communities, deceased former Chernobyl zone residents were denied burial in local cemeteries, fearing radiation contamination of, I guess, of whoever is buried there, but <laughs> doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? <laughs> the economies of the irradiated regions have all but collapsed, and few, if any, new enterprises have emerged over the past decade. Organized agriculture in the most heavily irradiated regions ended almost immediately after the disaster, and the system of collective farms throughout the rest of the country largely ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Corrupt officials sold off any remaining tractors and other technology, or appropriated them themselves, so that people still residing in the irradiated territories were forced to work small plots by hand or to resort to pre-industrial methods employing horses and even oxen and hand threshing and drying of grain. Little help has come from the government, which also provided little or unreliable information to the residents about risks, safe methods, and available relief programs. Organizations like the United Nations Development Program, some NGOs, and some religious sects are helping individual communities. Since 2006, the UNDP invest, uh, uh, investment and support has almost entirely been in the area of economic development projects, leaving social, humanitarian, and spiritual support 
to NGOs and religious organizations. Yet many scholars and community activists do not assess these developments positively. For example, in those communities where some religious sects have established congregations, the material conditions of life have improved and people have created new communities. But ethnographers and sociologists bemoan the establishment of these communities these, uh, as their members are encouraged to turn their backs on the past and their traditional ways and beliefs. They break apart the already fragile traditional communities and create smaller splintered communities that consciously reject the old ways and no longer interact in any meaningful new ways with the surviving traditional communities and their members. An example from one village will illustrate the problem. Uh, we were explained the story when we visited a, a village up near the Belarus border. When the orthodox uncle of a man who joined one of the newly formed evangelical communities died, uh, the member of the evangelical community refused to enter the orthodox church and participate in the funeral of his favorite uncle who virtually raised him. Uh, as he had been warned by the other members of his congregation that his uncle's Orthodox church was not a true church and its members not true believers. So ethnographers, you know, they, when we learn that such and such a sect is strong in this community, they take a, sh a sharp turn to the left or the right to go to the next village because they realize that they're not going to get anything from there, or at least not anything that they want from there. Approximately 60 to 70 percent of the population of the irradiated villages is now composed of pensioners, people with few choices, resources, or ambitions other than to live out their remaining lives on their small plots of land. As mentioned earlier, many but not all younger families with children have moved out of the zone seeking a healthier environment and better economic opportunities, and many are afraid to even visit their irradiated homelands and the aging relatives that have remained there. It's the fate of the elderly residents that is of particular concern to scholars and traditional cult of traditional culture. The passing of the older members of the population of these territories, those over 70 years of age, is the greatest threat. These people represent the last generation that participated in the traditional folk culture of the region before a long and tragic sequence of events that had serious impacts on this and other traditional folk cultures of Ukraine with the Chernobyl disaster only the most recent. The primary impact of the Chernobyl disaster and the efforts undertaken to mitigate the disaster was to speed up this process, to break up communities and the possible lines of transmission of cultural information, to remove grandchildren from grandparents and destroy whole communities and scatter their residents, to make traditional ways of life impractical and unnecessary and in some cases impossible. Therefore, the efforts of Ukrainian scholars to record and document this now rapidly fading and stressed culture have gained tremendous importance. And it's essential that the emerging effort to transmit the rescued knowledge of this traditional culture be carried out if it is not to suffer the same fate as countless plant and animal species and other traditional cultures and languages have during the 20th century. Total extinction, remembered only in musty texts on obscure archive shelves. My original goal for going to Ukraine on a Fulbright Scholar Grant was to create a documentary film informing the world of the efforts of these Ukrainian scholars. I worked with a Ukrainian cinematographer, Sidhi Marchenko, there holding the video camera, uh, recording an interview with a, a former potter. We recorded over 50 high quality video cassettes of the field work and people in the zone and took more than 3,000 photographs between the two of us. While the film component of this project has not been fully realized for a variety of reasons, I won't go into those, uh, my Ukrainian colleague and I did produce the exhibition, which hopefully you will see shortly or uh, over the next two weeks, uh, which originally opened, uh, as Frank had mentioned, on the 20th anniversary of the disaster, both in a Ukrainian folk museum, folk culture museum uh, in Kyiv, Ukraine, and in a Ukrainian museum uh, in New York City. I've since presented numerous talks at international conferences, at the Folklife Center at the Smithsonian Institution, at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard, and at numerous universities and organizations throughout the country on this project. The exhibition documents the work 
of Ukrainian scholars during two major expeditions in which I participated. One in the summer of 2004 to villages in the territories outside into the west of the 30 kilometer exclusion zone, uh, where most people were not forcibly evacuated. A second expedition took place in the winter of 2004, 2005, which visited a number of the evacuated villages within the exclusion zone. In the villages outside the exclusion zone, the goal was to interview residents of all ages about the impacts of the disaster and radiation on their lives in the post chernobyl period uh, and in the irradiated territories to, gain, to gather important information on their past and present cultural practices, rituals, traditions, folklores, and what role they continue to play in their present lives. In the village of Lovkovici, which is about 150 or so kilometers uh, west of the exclusion zone. Uh, we arrived on the religious holiday feast day of the Maccabees, or in Ukrainian, Makovia, when an old tradition of blessing water, flowers, and poppy heads takes place. Traditionally, the seeds in the blessed, blessed poppy heads are scattered about the house to counter any charms of spells and witches. And as you can see, many of the people in, in attending this service and were having their poppy seeds blessed, whether they actually spread them around their house, I don't know. Uh, but that's, that's the tradition behind it. The girls pictured here are from a, th uh, a thriving village about 100 kilometers west of the exclusion zone, but still uh, having suffered considerable irradiation, uh, where there is an active folklore club uh, which sustains and supports the learning and practice of traditional songs, dances, costumes, and other traditions. It's exactly this kind of uh, organization that it would be hoped could be established throughout the zone to somehow be the vehicle to return this knowledge and information to the current residents uh, uh, of this area. The goal of the expedition into the exclusion zone was to systematically go through the buildings in evacuated villages and to collect objects of traditional material culture which were not damaged or already removed, as well as any manuscript and documentary materials found in the abandoned houses and administrative offices of the villages. These items were brought to a central collection facility in the town of Chernobyl, an old movie theater, and examined for radiation levels, whether similar objects had already been collected and whether they could be safely cleaned and stored. Those that did not meet these criteria were returned to the villages from which they were taken. All of the evacuated villages, however, were not empty. In the several years immediately following the disaster, more than 2,000 former residents, mostly elderly pensioners, made their way back to their villages and homes. Resettlement of these villages was at first prohibited for a variety of reasons, including security, health threats, and to prevent an influx of squatters and the plunder of the largely intact households. The authorities maintained for a while the charade that people would eventually be allowed to return to their homes. The returning residents often traveled in the dark of night to avoid detection once they were within the zone uh, of exclusion. Some villages had dozens of returning residents, others only a handful. People returned to their old homes and again took up housekeeping, but now without the benefit of electricity or gas for their stoves or any other moder modern conveniences, they resumed a way of life more reminiscent of the pre-industrial era. They heated their homes with wood, kept a cow and a pig or two, and grew their own food, just as they always had. Only now the food was the wood uh, that they burned was irradiated, and the ashes in which the radiation, radiation was now more concentrated uh, were worked into the gardens to fertilize the vegetables and fruits they grew and ate. The wild mushrooms they gathered, just as they always had, were especially highly contaminated as radiation was concentrated in the fungi which occupied the upper strata of the soil. The milk from their cows was contaminated with strontium-90 and cesium-137, and constant exposure to low-level radiation took its toll. 
When we asked the elderly returnees if they were afraid of becoming ill from the effects of the radiation, they almost universally, universally replied that it did not matter. They were told that in 10 to 20 years, the effects of the radiation might kill them. They all, with a sardonic smile, said that in 10 to 20 years, they would all be dead anyway. So they would rather spend the last years of their lives in their own homes, where many of them were born, and where their parents and other relatives were buried, rather than in communities where they were strangers and shunned. What struck me was that these returning residents did not cluster together in neighboring houses, forming new reconfigured communities within their old communities, but resided in their own homes, often at, uh, at scattered or at opposite ends of the villages, frequently not seeing neighbors for days. Part of the reason for this was a respect for the property of their former neighbors as they held on to hopes that those neighbors might also someday return to their old homes and be their neighbors again. A significant consequence of this self-imposed isolation was a culture of reuse and readaptation of objects necessary for everyday life. As a tool or other object broke or was no longer able to function as designed, it was discarded and other similar ob objects were sought in the many empty neighboring houses, of course, once they realized that nobody's coming back. Or objects were refashioned to new functions. The village landscape became an open uh, open garbage dumps of broken and useless objects and crumbling houses. A culture of repair, replacement, or regeneration was replaced with one of decay, repurposing, and abandonment. Over an eight-year period, I regularly visited a woman, Anastasia Avramchuk, or Baba Nastya, as she liked to be called, who was the lone resident of a village that at the time of the disaster contained more than 1,000 households. As it was located about 80 kilometers from the reactor uh, to the west and outside of the 30 kilometer exclusion zone, a number of residents from several villages within the exclusion zone were relocated to this village shortly after the event. It was about five years after the relocation that the authorities got around to measuring and mapping the levels of radiation contamination in that region, only to discover that the radiation in this and surrounding villages was higher than that found in some of the villages within the exclusion zone. As a result, the entire old village population and the new village population relocated there were moved to safer surroundings. Baba Nasha refused to leave her home her cows, and as you can see in this picture, her ancestors buried in the village cemetery. During a particularly harsh winter of very heavy snowfall, the roof of her house caved in. You can just see on the right side the gable roof, the only part that stayed up. The rest of it just fell in and flattened. Uh, the ca the cave-in destroyed the chimney from her wood-burning stove and oven and prevented her from using the stove to heat her house or cook. Yet she remained, cooking over an open fire in the yard, cultivating her garden, and caring for her one or two cows. When I visited in the spring following the collapse of her roof, the floor of the house was covered with buckets and pans collecting dripping water every time it rained, yet she still refused to leave or even to move to a neighboring house in better condition. She pushed her bed and other possessions into a dry corner and went on with her life. She cared for the old church in the village, keeping it clean and open for anyone who passed by. Because it was outside of the zone, travel wasn't restricted. And so people who had been relocated often came back and visited, drove through or whatever, and would stop in at the church, leave her little messages. She would. Uh, leave, leave, leave a, a, the name of a relative that she would then pray for them and so forth. So this really was a very important thing to her. When the village was forcibly evacuated, the iconostasis of the church with its icons was removed. You can see the uh, silhouette, uh, unpainted logs where the icon, iconostas had been uh, uh, initially placed. Uh, and it was uh, removed and taken to the new village uh, uh, where a, a church was constructed. Uh, to which the people were relocated. 
Baba Nastra brought her own icons and embroidered cloths to decorate those icons from home, and care of the church building became an important part of her daily activities. She eventually left the village after sustaining injuries from being dragged through a field by her runaway bullock to which she was tethered. Uh, and I lost contact with her upon my return to the US a short time later. Of the approximately 2,000 people who made their way back to their homes in the exclusion zone, less than 200 remain alive within the zone. Some have left to live with relatives outside the most heavily irradiated territories as they age and could no longer manage life on their own. Others succumb to illnesses and age-related maladies. Still others to radiation-induced tumors and cancers. Their self-imposed exile from a world that betrayed them also meant isolation from more intensive and effective medical care and led to increased mortality from illnesses that likely could have been treated with adequate medications and hospitalizations. They were not entirely on their own in the zone. Event, uh, eventually, the authorities realized that you know, they're, they're not hurt, hurting anybody. They're just going to be there, and they realized that they should let them live out their lives. A visiting nurse program was uh, uh, established that once every few weeks, they would visit the villages and the few people who were still alive and at least provide some very, very basic uh, uh, medical support to them. As well, a truck would come every other week uh, that had uh, necessities, bread, soap, other, other t items that they couldn't uh, grow or produce themselves, uh, that they would use their pension checks, uh, uh, money, earnings from their pensions to pay for these things, usually at a very low subsidized rate. In addition to the returning residents, uh, the exclusion zone was populated by people who wanted or needed to live below the radar. Dropouts from society, squatters, and people who wished to live a life of near self-sufficiency, disengaged from the chaos, uncertainty, and injustices of everyday life in an emerging post-Soviet society. In the past few years, a new population has begun to move into areas within and outside of the exclusion zone, which has been declared safe for occupation but not for agriculture. Refugees from the current war and Russian occupation in eastern Ukraine. Many of these people lost their homes, jobs, and businesses to the violence of war and fled the repressive regimes put in place and supported by Russia. They are attracted to the irradiated territories by lots of empty houses and low-priced real estate. And a new life in a region free from war, if not free from other hazards. Marina Kovalenko and her two daughters provide one example. Four years ago, they packed up all of their belongings and fled from Toshkivka, uh, a large industrial town in the Donbas region of eastern Ukraine, which is right on the edges of the territory that's now the war zone and occupied uh, uh, with the support of, of the Russian military. After four years of conflict in the east of the country, an estimated 14,000 people have lost their lives. Many others have sustained both physical and emotional injuries, and about two million people have been displaced and recognized as ref refugees or internally displaced persons. Marina was too poor to buy even one of the empty houses when she arrived in the village of Steschina. Uh, you can see it's just outside the limits of the exclusion zone. Instead, um, the governing council offered her family an unusual house share. In return for their bed and board, the family cared for an elderly man in the late stages of dementia. When he died two years later, the family inherited the house and now occupy the house, two daughters and, and the woman, Marina. Like other, like other residents in the region, they grow their own food, keep some livestock. When asked whether they were concerned about the radiation, Marina responded, and I quote, radiation may kill us slowly, but it doesn't shoot or bomb us. It's better to live with radiation than war, end of quote. Another example is provided by Vadim Minjuk, a metal worker. 
in his former hometown of Horluka, also right on the edges of the territory. Actually, it was a, a horrible uh, a part of the battle zone uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, Vadim was a businessman turning over a million dollars a year. But after the town ended up on the front line, pounded by artillery, his once flourishing factories and warehouses were obliterated. Some are just craters now. A relative have heard, had heard about cheap property for sale near Chernobyl. He went to see an abandoned grain silo in the village of Dechatke. Lying right on the border of the exclusion zone, property was cheap, but it was also close enough to the capital city of Keiu, about a little less than 100 kilometers away, to make it a viable business opportunity. Buying up the warehouse for $1,400 and a further three houses for just $240, he connected them all to the electricity grid and started up a smelting business. Vadim even re-employed seven of his former workers from Donbas, offering them accommodations by converting one of his houses into a hostel. Vadim stated, and I quote, I can make a living and help my workers to make money too. I'm the largest taxpayer here in the village. After all, I'm Ukrainian and I want to help my country, end of quote. While the efforts of Ukrainian scholars engaged in this project of cultural rescue were truly heroic, they only achieved a small part of what they had set out to accomplish. They assembled an incredibly rich archive of gathered objects and information, but only a small fraction of these collections have been analyzed and even less made public. Lack of financial resources from the government to properly catalog and curate the collections means that they are poorly stored and curated and not easily accessible. While some excellent publications have emerged, especially the work of several linguists on the specific dialects spoken by the people of Polisia, uh, several treatises by architectural historians on the traditional architecture, wooden architecture, and some amazing recordings that have been uh, of, of traditional songs and singing traditions that have been turned into CDs uh, as a result of that uh, ethnomusicologists' research and recording of songs. Uh, most of their available reporting has been largely anecdotal and not quite analytical. The project also was limited in its scope uh, by romantic notions of what traditional folk culture is, uh, uh, a belief that it is an unchanging system of beliefs, traditions, and material culture. And also, uh, influenced by an intense hatred of the impact of more than 70, year, 70 years of Soviet rule and social engineering on the Ukrainian population, which seriously threatened or destroyed this folk culture. Many Ukrainian ethnographers and folklorists revere the mythical golden age of pre-Soviet life when people lived happily in traditional communities and followed timeless folk traditions and rituals. They ignore the constant changes and influences peasant societies endured during frequent political and governmental changes, wars, and ec economic expansions and contractions, instead seeing folk culture and its traditions as constant and unchanging. Though they largely refuse to acknowledge that the new life under the Soviet system created or imposed new rules of social behavior, new responses and behaviors to those rules, and new traditions. As a result, they have made little or no effort to document the new ways of community life created by the people, as well as those imposed on them under the Soviet system. Instead, they focused exclusively on collecting material from the pre-Soviet traditional folk culture. While this was certainly a valuable exercise, given the fact that the people who actually lived in this pre-Soviet folk culture and carried this information in their memories were aging and dying, it also missed the opportunity to gain a first-hand understanding of the full nature and reciprocal process of the Soviet transformation on the traditional folk culture and vice versa. Perhaps future generations will be able to mine this information as they attempt to understand the historic culture of this region of Ukraine. But it will be up to them to construct a new understanding of what this all meant, as sadly they have not been left a significant and coherent analytical framework or conclusions from the work that was carried out by their predecessors in the recent 
post-Chernobyl period. I'd like to conclude uh, my presentation with several short videos from some of the material my colleagues said he Marchenko and I collected during the two expeditions in which we participated. Uh, I hope it will give you a, a more lively picture of the people and places impacted by the Chernobyl disaster and of the nature of the field work carried out. There's five videos. They're between a minute and two minutes long, so I'll set them up and uh, let them play. Uh, This first one uh, is a filming of, of a winter expedition into one of the uh, evacuated villages called Ladishichi within the exclusion zone. And it, it uh, sort of films the conditions under which this field work was done and some of the things that they were collecting where they were, where they were going and looking. There's not a lot of talk in this, just a little bit. Uh, mostly it's visual. The others have a lot more sound. You'll notice that people have masks on, but they're around their throats, and not everybody. So, uh, so they weren't even wearing them. They put them on their, on their, over their heads, but they weren't uh, quite wearing them. A pretty cavalier attitude towards what they were working with. These woods have grown up since 1986. They actually got lost going into the village. <laughs> uh, you can see an orchard, so they're close to the village. So they're collecting objects from the house that were still in there. A flax comb. Spinning whorl. So these objects were carried back to the bus out on a road and taken to that mo old movie theater, the storage facility. We usually arrive back after dark and unloaded. Okay, this next one is from a village called Levkovici, actually where the church service was going, some of the photographs of the church service. Uh, it's a village that was established in 1450, so quite an old village uh, doc with documentation going back that far. And as I mentioned, about 100, oh, 100 to 120 kilometers west of the Chernobyl zone. So this is that uh, uh, holiday celebration, uh, Feast of the Maccabees. It looks, it's a very rich park countryside there, still agriculture being carried on, still a very, very substantial village, uh, a fair number of children still living there. <laughs> 
the celebration, there would be a procession around the church. Okay, the next uh, bit is from a village named Kishin, where we invited the elderly folks to dress a young woman in a traditional costume. So it's a transformation before your eyes. It drew quite a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone had a little advice on what the right way to do it was. Okay, this next one involves a musicologist and four subjects of uh, quite elderly women who insisted on getting dressed up in, in their traditional costumes in order to sing since we were going to be filming them. Uh, just a very short clip of this gives you a hint of the harmonies uh, and tonality of folk singing, traditional singing in the Policia region. The ethnographer, uh, ethnomusicologist is a man named uh, Yevhen Yefremov, a really noted ethnomusicologist at the Tchaikovsky National Conservatory of Music in Kyiv. Just a short little sample. And then the final one, it's from that folklore club uh, in the village of Listvin, about 125 kilometers west, again, not an evacuated village, and one that uh, did have a UNDP community center there and was really uh, doing pretty well. In the folklore club, obviously, uh, you'll notice by the number of girls involved, uh, uh, was quite active and, and uh, successful. You'll see in the exhibit, there's a, a panel of photographs of these girls, along with a number of photographs that we found in the historical society there at this folklore center from the very early 20th century. And you, you can identify 
grandmothers of these very girls. Their faces are so similar to the faces that you see in these photographs from the early 20th century. Thank you very much. That's it. Okay, we'll take a few questions. A few questions. Remember, we can always continue this, the reception and the exhibit. Um, why don't you manage your questions? Okay, okay. Go right ahead. Yeah. the exclusion zone and kind of take people around the abandoned areas and the reactors. Um, and I was wondering if you had any opinions on that, because now suddenly there's all these foreigners who are traipsing through this exclusion zone. And if you think that the kind of almost way that they would gawk at the people who were, remain there is actually contributing to the preservation of the kind of Polician culture, or whether it's almost degrading it in a certain way, or if you have an opinion on that particular industry? Yeah. Well, mo most of the tours go into the city of Pripyat, which is abandoned, you know, uh, empty. Uh, and so, and they're, and they're very controlled to a large extent. You can hire a, a, a guide who will take your car load, your family, whatever, a group, a small group of people through. But again, um, it's pretty tightly controlled. And, and it's real theater, too, because uh, they make you put Tyvek suits on and put uh, uh, masks on and little booties over your shoes, which in reality is not that necessary, but it, it sort of emphasizes and adds a little drama to, to the fact that you're going into this irradiated zone. Right now, the radiation has dropped to about 30 centimeters. The, the particles, radioactive particles, have sort of migrated down uh, 30 years, 30 some odd years on to about 30 centimeters, a foot below, below surface. Um, and so the ambient radiation, that ground surface, unless you're standing on a hot spot, uh, uh, is, reg is pretty normal. I mean, it's slightly elevated, but not, not uh, uh, particularly high. Um, so it's, it's, it's not particularly dangerous to go into there for you know a couple of hours excursion. Um, there, have, there has been talk of turning the city of Pripyat into a UNESCO World Heritage Site <laughs> and a park, and so it's sort of formalizing this whole issue of preservation and, and conservation in some way and interpretation, uh, rather than just leaving it to tour guides who make a, make a profit doing all of this. Uh, but that's, that's, that's probably a still a long way off. Um, they don't have a whole lot of, con they don't go out generally into the villages where the people are still living. Uh, that's controlled pretty much. Uh, and I imagine another, well, I was going to say another, another few years and most of the people who returned will, will be, uh, have passed away or gone. But there are these other people who are uh, infiltrating in and sneaking in under the radar, so to speak, to just kind of live the way they want to live. Can you hear me? Speak, okay. Speak up. Oh, great, great, great. Um, just looking at all the interviews, it seems like you have a lot of active women in the videos. Why are there like an equal amount of men also in these clubs and organizations to the west of these sites? Or 
or in these sites? Like, why is there not a strong presence of men in these? Well, areas? there's a lot of reasons for that. The general life expectancy of men in Ukrainian society is about 55. Uh, for women, it's probably 10 to 15 years later. Um, and so the ba once, once you reach a certain age, the balance of the sexes, males to females, changes radically. Um, in the, of the returnees, it was really uh, uh, probably 80% women, 20% men. Ooh, and and the men would, you know, always pass away first. Uh, a lot of reasons for it. Uh, uh, men drank a lot, men smoked a lot, uh, the women less so. Uh, uh, the men were, unless they became uh, uh, active in the party activities in the Soviet period, they were marginalized. And so there was all these psychological, emotional uh, issues that, that uh, affected these people uh, and so forth. So it's, it's a very complex complex uh, uh, sort of constellation of issues that, that created that. But uh, yes, there is an imbalance, and that is very much reflected in, the, in what you see. Uh, the, at the church, there's another reason for it, and is that it's mostly women who were members of the church congregation and the men who were less likely to be. But there were less men in the village, nonetheless. Yes, David? Thank you for an, an amazing presentation. Um, the question, water is uh, life. Uh, radiated water is death. And you're showing us a picture of the wetland, and I'm from the landscape and city planning department. Are there any major problems of reforestation to capture radiation so it won't seep into the groundwaters or into the uh, wetlands and you know the birds are there? And, yeah. Well, you know, the reforestation is actually one of the danger, big dangers that's occurred in the Chernobyl zone. It was largely, uh, uh, I mean, there were, the wetlands were forested and swamped, and there certainly were a lot of the wetlands. Uh, but there was also a lot of agricultural land as well. Uh, flax was grown there, and hops especially were, were, were uh, a specialty there. Um, that's now all gone to forest, but it hasn't, forest management, hasn't continued with it. And so, yes, the trees sort of capture it, but they drop it right back down with all their leaves every, every fall. Uh, and the fear now is a lightning strike or an intentional forest fire that will burn uncontrolled because it's just continuous forest in there. Uh, and it will be a disaster equivalent to the original explosion of the reactor and the amount of r radiation it will once again release into the atmosphere. So there, were, there was talk uh, a few years back of uh, uh, raising money from the international community to, to uh, take, initiate some sort of forestry management program to cut, you know, 100 meter fire breaks through this continuous forest so that it could at least be contained somehow. Uh, but then the question was, well, so it isn't mitigating the radiation in any way. They cut the trees and they drive over them with their skitters and they just return it right back into the soil. So there's no mitigation underway right now. There was talk of building an uh, energy generation plant, burning that wood. But then you've got highly concentrated, if you, you know, you can fill the stacks with scrubbers and catch, what, 99% of the particulate matter or whatever. But then what do you do with that captured ash? It has to be encased in glass or something and buried for a th thousands and thousands of years. So it's, it's, a, it's a you know really complicated issue uh, on what to do about it. In terms of the water, um, the Pripyat River, which runs through right near the reactor, empties into a, a huge, like 30, 30 mile long reservoir. Of the, of the main river, the Dnipro River, which is kind of the equivalent of the Mississippi of Ukraine. It bisects the country and runs down into the Black Sea. And so uh, what they say uh, is that that water is diluted to such an extent that it has very little impact. And the particulate matter in it's settled out in that big lake. 
the big reservoir. And so there's not that much. But uh, measurements of water downstream that has uh, uses water from the Dnipro River for irrigation has resulted in elevated, not significantly, but elevated levels of radiation in the soils in the irrigated fields downstream. So, and much, much of Ukraine takes its drinking water from that river. So it's a, it, you know, it's not an easy problem there at all. Uh, uh, microphone. Uh, your map showed that the um, uh, area of high radiation is right on the border and uh, uh, much of it is in uh, Belarus. Uh, what, do you have some comments about the effect of, uh, of this on, in, on the other side of the border? Yeah, I think 70 some odd percent of the heaviest uh, uh, radionuclides were deposited in Belarus. Um, I think it's like 23 percent of that country was uh, seriously irradiated as opposed to eight, eight or so percent in Ukraine. Um, Lukashenko, the current president uh, of Belarus, is actually initiating homesteading programs on the irradiated lands, saying, come on, we'll give you land for free. Go on in there. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And so, you know, that's what's happening. There was, there was a film uh, 20 years ago or so about the, the uh, heart problems that chil children in Belarus were encountering. Um, Pretty serious stuff, but you know one of the real unfortunate uh, failures, if you will, that's, that's a word that I've used a lot today, uh, is that this, this disaster provided a wonderful laboratory for determining what is the impact of long-term exposure to low-level radiation. You know, it's very different from the bombs that exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, quick, uh, above the surface, and the radiation, in a sense, dissipated after a, little, a while. Here, it's going to be in the ground for 100,000 years. Uh, and so the Japanese uh, continued some careful uh, monitoring, uh, but that eventually ended. And uh, the UN decided not to do it anymore because there are so many diverse factors that affect this and the sampling, uh, we, don't, we can't quite control that. And so they don't want to do that. Ukrainian uh, medical establishment has a lot of careful studies, but the UN didn't consult them because they don't read Ukrainian. <laughs> Simple as that. And they say, these aren't, these aren't juried papers. So we can't use them in our, in our uh, uh, evidence, in our, in our conclusions. So it's a, it's a very difficult situation. And now even the Ukrainian government is backing off from that. So that opportunity that existed for science and understanding the impacts of long-range exposure to low-level radiation has been flubbed, dropped, lost, uh, uh, and, isn't, and isn't, isn't happening to allow any kind of significant um, interpretable data. I mean, there are lots of small studies that show clearly a rise of thyroid in certain populations, thyroid cancer in populations, other autoimmune uh, uh, illnesses, heart, heart issues, and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's actually one of the conspiracy, one of the very few conspiracy theories that I uh, uh, believe in, uh, and involves the United Nations World Health Organization, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, who wanted to downplay the dangers and impacts of the nuclear industry, uh, saying that, you know, only 50 people died from the Chernobyl disaster. These are the people who died from direct radiation poisoning, you know, the firemen who were sent up on the roof to pick up blocks of of uh, uh, highly radioactive material who died sh soon after. But, you know, it's in the thousands now of people who died. The, the liquidators, the 600,000 people who uh, were drafted and told to go, go in there for 
15 days at a time. Uh, many of them are suffering a wide range of problems, suicides, uh, autoimmune sicknesses, heart issues, uh, just feeling complete weakness. Uh, and these, you know, they're still alive, but there, there's things happening to them. Um, I heard one story uh, of a woman who said her father died as a result of the Chernobyl disaster. And I said, well, how did that happen? She said, well, when he was younger, in this Stalinist period, um, he was arrested and sent to Siberia. He returned, survived that, came back, and the night, of the ni the night after the Chernobyl disaster, uh, police came to, his, to the house at the middle of the night and started pounding on the door. He said he remembered uh, when he was arrested that that's what happened to him, had a heart attack and died. And she said, is, is he not a victim of this disaster as well? Uh, so it's, a, it's really a complex and, and I interesting um, series of, of circumstances that, that come together to both deny all of this and, and, and agree with it. You know, nuclear energy was pushed, particularly when the East and the, and the Middle East and the West, they're all at war over various religious, ideological, and other reasons. And nuclear energy is being said to be the clean energy that will save us from this disaster. And now, you know, with the concern of climate change and, and greenhouse gases going in, Nuclear energy doesn't produce that, and so we need to now expand it and not contract it. So uh, I believe that it's a, it was a very intentional um, agreement amongst these international organizations to continue to downplay the impacts of this disaster. Uh, just one more little story. Uh, a scientist from the University of South Carolina, his name is Timothy Mousseau, he's an evolutionary biologist who for the past 30 years has been doing research uh, in the Chernobyl zone. Um, he's worked with barn swallows. Barn swallows uh, uh, always return to the same nest year after year. Uh, and the Ukraine, in, in um, the collective farms are all not functioning, and they had these huge buildings for tractors and cattle and so forth. And the birds keep coming back to them. So they capture them, they tag them, they, they weigh them, they uh, uh, inspect them physically. And it's come, come up with uh, uh, clear evidence that birds are suffering a, a wide range of mutations, uh, crossed beaks, white patches like albinism, which really affects their ability to mate. Uh, cross tail feathers uh, that they shouldn't be, and fewer and fewer returning back to these same places. They also maintained study uh, locations outside the radioactive area and even in other countries of Europe and did the same kinds of studies to measure uh, 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 the impact on these birds. So it's a very, very uh, clear impact. And the latest discovery, which they actually published in Nature magazine, was that a number of the birds that they were testing, their brains were 5% smaller than birds outside the zone. He was invited to speak at a conference at the United Nations, uh, sort of on the anniversary of the Chernobyl zone. Every few years they do something like this. And in one of, he was supposed to appear twice. In his first talk, he just referenced the fact about birds, the smaller brains, and raised, posed this, this question and so can we suspect that perhaps there's a similar, some sort of impact on humans as well that might affect their brains? Um, when he finished this talk, uh, he was pulled aside by one of the organizers of the conference and told, you know, you better not mention that during your next talk. You have to promise us you won't or we won't let you go on. And so they didn't want that information to even be discussed in an open forum. Uh, the, the, the possibilities of that. And so it's a real, it's a real uh, uh, tough spot, both that Ukraine is in, uh, its people, uh, its government that is continually, I think 20% of, uh, of their budget goes to remedy, paying out pensions and remedying, um, um, attempting to remedy some of these situations. And that's not anything that's gonna stop any, any time in the near future. Okay, well we've
Thank you.